we get started, um, some more folks I expect will be joining us in a few minutes. Um, however, thank you for joining us. This is Rights of Nature 101. Uh, my name is Mari Margill with the Center for Democratic and Environmental Rights. And presenting today will be our senior legal counsel, Thomas Lindsay with the Center for Democratic and Environmental Rights. Um, this is a free training, sort of the basics, fundamentals of rights of nature. Um, you can take a look at our website, we'll put it into the chat, um, but we have other kinds of trainings. Uh, this is rights of nature 101, we have rights of nature 201 and other kinds of trainings and webinars. Um, and so we invite you to take a look at all those resources, um, which are up on our website and of course are free, um, as well as if you have a group or an organization or work with a government that you're interested in having a training specific to your organization, we can certainly talk about that too. Um, so we really see this as the beginning of a conversation. We hope you get a lot out of it, but also if you want to follow up with us, learn more, not only should you visit our website, you can get in touch with us, we'll put our email address into um, the chat box as well. Um, so I don't want to take up too much time, but just to say that we are doing work in a lot of different places. Thomas will touch on some of it today um, in the United States at the local level, at state level, and even at the federal level, as well as we do quite a bit of work outside of the United States as well um, in places like Ecuador and Australia and Nepal. Um, so there's a lot of work that's occurring around the world with the rights of nature today's Focus will be kind of what are the basics of rights of nature and in particular focusing on what we can do in our own communities in the United States. And for some of us who are not from the United States, perhaps elsewhere. Um, so we're gonna put a lot of resources into the chat. Feel free to use those. We'd love to keep you updated um, as well going forward. So please feel free to sign up for our e-newsletter, follow us on social media, all that stuff. So there, let me introduce for you Thomas Lindsay, Senior Legal Counsel with the Center for Democratic and Environmental Rights. He has a long history um, with the rights of nature and wrote the very first rights of nature law adopted anywhere in the world uh, back in 2006 and also worked with me in Ecuador with the Constituent Assembly on their rights of nature constitutional framework. And his work has continued um, for the past almost 15 years now in this area. So he brings a lot of experience to bear on the subject. So he's going to present and then we'll have an opportunity to open things up for Q&A and some discussion. So again, welcome everybody. Um, we ask that you keep yourselves muted during it so that we can hear the presenter well. Um, and then we, again, we'll open it up for Q&A after the presentation. Thomas. Great, thanks Mari. And uh, welcome to everyone on the, on the call today. So as Mari stated, we do we do a, a bunch of different kind of webinars uh, as we work with communities. This is kind of like the the starting point or rights of nature 101 is how we refer to it. Kind of the what is rights of nature? Where is it being done in the in the United States and around the globe? What does it mean? Uh, and then a, a update on the latest places that are evolving with rights of nature laws like. Orange County, Florida, which became the largest municipality in the US to pass a rights of nature law this past November, a county of 1.5 million people. So we'll talk a little bit more about uh, what, what that law was, how it was passed, those types of things. We've been running out of time on these uh, one hour webinars. Um, I usually speak for about 25, 30 minutes, uh, take us through the basic framework, and then there's time for Q&A at the end uh, in terms of people that wanna know more or ask questions about specific things, but don't hesitate uh, to actually type into the chat box as I'm speaking. If you have questions real time, I'll try to pick them up as we as we move through. Um, I think someone described this as, as kind of, you know, trying to drink from a fire hose. <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot of material, a lot of information. We're gonna hit you with a lot of stuff. So uh, if you have questions as we go through, just type them into the chat and I'll try to pick them up as we go on. So. So just to jump into things, what are we talking about today? Well, what we're, what we're talking about today is recognizing human civil rights type protections for nature. Uh, so I'll say that again, recognizing human civil rights type protections for nature. And the reason why that kind of bends our brains sometimes is that we're used to talking about civil rights for people, civil rights for humans. So we're used to talking about the US Constitution's Bill of Rights. 
or uh, state bill, bills of rights within the United States. So each state within the US has a constitution, has a bill of rights, a declaration of rights. So we're used to talking about rights for people, civil rights for people, but we're not used to talking about civil rights for nature. Uh, and today we're gonna talk about what that means. So again, recognizing human civil rights type protections for nature, legally enforceable civil rights type protections for nature. Now we wouldn't be here talking about this concept of human civil rights type protections for nature if we had an existing environmental protection system that was actually working. <laughs> and I don't think, I, I think most of us on the call probably share the same experience that we have an environmental protection system that isn't working. So whether it's climate change or whether it's the pollution issues or that we face or acidification of the ocean or deforestation, it doesn't seem that the existing system of environmental protection that we have, the environmental protection laws that we have in place are actually working to protect the environment. And so just some statistics, uh, again, the idea here is not to depress all of us, but the, the, what's the current status of things? Well, in the United States alone, 4 billion pounds, and that's billion with a P, of toxic chemicals are released into the atmosphere each year. So 4 billion, 4 billion pounds of toxic chemicals released into the atmosphere annually in the US uh, each year. And that's legally, these are, these are legally permitted emissions. Uh, 80,000 industrial chemicals are currently in use. Uh, 700 are now found within every human body. If we tested our bodies today, you would find upwards of 700 of these industrial chemicals currently lodged in our body. Uh, things like flame retardants uh, and other toxic kind of chemical constituents. Uh, half of all plant and animal species have been driven to extinction. 90% of all original forests have been logged. 40% of all waterways in the US fail to meet minimum clean water standards. Uh, there's the question of uh, uh, swimmable and fishable standards for waterways in the United States. 40 years after the Clean Water Act was passed in the US, 40% of all waterways fail to meet those minimum clean water standards. And this is not even talking about the elephant in the room, which is climate change, global warming, these huge environmental issues that revolve around us. Article today in the paper, just to bring us up to a contemporary sense about the extinction of the monarch butterflies that we seem to be teetering on the edge of. So all these huge environmental problems doesn't seem that we have an environmental protection system is actually uh, doing much more than perhaps slowing them down. Uh, there's some of these issues down slightly, but certainly not stopping them. So what do people do when they come to this realization that the environmental protection system isn't quite working to protect the planet? Well, a lot of people that come to those conclusions are folks like myself who attempted to make those environmental protection laws work for a number of years. So my particular journey began in 1995 as an environmental lawyer uh, with the nonprofit law firm that I founded back in 1995 to actually make these laws work. So I enforced the Clean Water Act on behalf of groups or the Clean Water Act uh, or the National Environmental Policy Act or permit appeals and zoning hearing board appeals and all those types of things. And for about 12 years, I, I did that work of what conventional environmental law is today, which is a corporation submits, usually a corporation or a business entity submits a permit application to a uh, agency to, act, to get permission to do something like put in a toxic waste incinerator or a 50,000 head hog factory farm or some other kind of facility that the corporation wants to build. And they submit a permit application that has to comply with the state regulations that dictate what has to be in the permit application for that project to move forward. And conventional environmental lawyers, what we do is sit in a room and on one side, we have the permit application that's submitted by the corporation. On the other side of the desk is the actual regulations themselves that have been promulgated by the state. And then we try to figure out what's missing or errors that have been made within the permit application so that they don't comply with the regulations that the state has put into place. So we end up, as I did for 12 years, going into court arguing to the judge, your honor, under section two, little c, little i, little two, little d, little Roman numeral two, little i, little c, little two, uh, that a signature was missing on page 27, or a bond amount that should have been posted wasn't posted correctly, or a macroinvertebrate water study was done, but it was 10 years old, and now it needs to be updated. But those types of things that are gaps, omissions, or deficiencies uh, within those processes 
that conventional environmental lawyers try to find mistakes that were made uh, within those processes and argue that permit uh, that the permit that had been issued by the agency for that particular project were issue, was issued in error that it never should have been issued. And I guess the, the place, the straw that broke this camel's back uh, after doing a lot of those, you know, 300 of those cases or so in front of judges, uh, was that uh, I had the lawyers for some of the largest uh, corporations in the United States coming up to me afterwards when we had won the first round of these cases to find something that was missing uh, and thank me for actually finding the gaps, omissions, and deficiencies in the permit application because then they could, the law firm could go back to the corporation and bill more hours to fix the gaps, omissions, and deficiencies that we had identified within the permit application in the first place. And what would happen three months later, of course, would be the corporation would come back with a new and improved permit application. And that new and improved permit application wouldn't have any of the gaps, omissions, and deficiencies that we had uh, discovered in that first round, and therefore the project would move forward. So the environmental regulatory scheme that we were working under really wasn't stopping anything from coming into these communities. And I think the, just to, to dot some more I's and cross some more T's here that uh, we at least thought we were costing the corporations money to hire the lawyers, come in, fight over the permit appeal process uh, and fight us. But what we learned under US law at that point was that the monies that the corporations spend to defend their permit issuances is tax deductible under the US tax code. It's tax deductible as a reasonable and necessary business expense under the tax code. So the corporations that you're fighting at that point to stop the issuance of the permit, uh, the monies that they're spending on the law firm to defend the permit issuance is tax deductible. Uh, in addition to that, sometimes we don't admit this to ourselves on a daily basis, but the folks writing the environmental regulations in the first place are generally the regulated industry that ostensibly those regulations are supposed to regulate. <laughs> and so the biggest corporations within the biggest industries are generally the folks that write the environmental regulations in the first place. And we have to ask ourselves, why would they put anything into those environmental regulations that allow communities to actually have a veto power or significantly impede the movement forward of a project that those industries were trying to put into those communities? <laughs> and so it, it, someone said to me back then, something that I remember uh, you know, all the way up until today. And she said, the only thing that environmental regulations regulate is environmentalists. The only thing that environmental regulations regulate is environmentalists. And of course, what she was saying is that these environmental regulations are essentially a script that these corporations draft about the issuance of these regulations. And when we come in to fight them, our defense is based on the very script that those corporations have written for the environmental regulations in the first place. That we're kind of working off of somebody else's script. We're on the defense. And it makes us predictable as to how we contest or defend against these permit issuances. It, it makes us predictable as to how we defend our own communities against these projects that were coming in. So like a lot, a lot of other conventional environmental lawyers that I've run into uh, across the past 10 or 15 years, we began to kind of re-examine the foundations of environmental law in the United States. Uh, you know, how was environmental law constituted? Where does it come from? And in the United States, we have what's called a Western system of law. Our law comes mostly from this uh, thing called English common law. So we have an English system of law uh, that was basically driven into our constitution, our source code, our system of law in the United States. And that Western system of law, not to put too fine a point on it, but the Western system of law basically treats nature as a dead thing. It treats nature as an inanimate thing as a dead thing, not as a living entity, as a system, you know, ecosystems and creatures and flora and fauna, but as a dead thing, an inanimate thing. That's how the Western system of law treats nature. Uh, so forests are seen for their timber value. Uh, we still in our language use things like words like undeveloped. We'll say, well, if there's no house on that piece of land, it's undeveloped. Well, no, it's, it's been developed for millions of years. It may have very sophisticated ecosystems on that piece of land. But when we say undeveloped, we're talking about it from an anthropocentric or homocentric viewpoint that there's nothing of man, nothing man made or nothing of man on that property. But in reality, it may be developed from an ecological sense to a very sophisticated or high place, but we don't recognize that 
uh, even with even with our language, uh, we don't tend to represent represent that or talk about it in those terms. Now contrast that with an indigenous value system, a, a, a tribal or indigenous value system in the U.S. The Ponca Nation in Oklahoma, the Ponca Tribal Nation, they speak of quote speaking for those without voices, i.e., the land and the rivers and the creatures. The White Earth Chippewa, uh, the Anishinaabe people, uh, White Earth Reservation in Minnesota, they talk about the flying people, the swimming people, and the singing people, referring to the animals and other creatures living on, on land. The Yurok Nation, the Yurok tribe in California, talks about the Klamath River as being a relative, so a living relative, uh, a living being. Uh, that's how they speak about nature and uh, ecosystems. And contrast that to coming back to this English common law system. Sir Francis Bacon, you know, this famous English philosopher, uh, it's not often we get to talk about Sir Francis Bacon when we're doing webinars, but Sir Francis Bacon, his famous quote was that the English system of law was about torturing nature on a rack to extract her secrets. So this is Sir Francis Bacon, and the quote is again, the job of Western civilization to progress, uh, have economic growth, all those things is to torture nature on a rack to extract her secrets. I can't think of any more disjunction between that quote and the quote of indigenous peoples about flying people, singing people, treating nature as a relative, living system, speaking for those about voices. I don't think there's anything more stark between those two views of the world, uh, if we want to use that phrase, about how the world is seen through those eyes. The Western system of law versus an indigenous value system. And of course, nature under a Western system of law is entirely treated as property. This is part of it being, being a thing or being dead. It's treated as property, which means you can buy and sell it. The more money you have under a U.S. system of law, the more land you can buy, the more ecosystems you can buy. And because of that, the more land or ecosystems you can destroy. Because part of the bundle of rights that comes with property ownership in Western civilization is the, uh, the right to destroy what you own in terms of that property. So when we talk about property, it's a bundle of rights. And part of those rights, one of those rights is a right to destroy. So because nature is property, it's wrapped up in our US constitutional structure. The US constitutional structure is all about property and commerce. You can page through it as much as you want, but you won't find the word nature within the US constitution, it doesn't exist. Uh, what you find is a lot of, of alluding, alluding to property and commerce and essentially the elevation of a certain set of values around property and commerce among all else. And we can't really blame the founding fathers as much as we would like to for these things. But they didn't know anything about acidification of the ocean or deforestation or global climate change, just not things that would have occurred to them. And so in terms of the sense of the times, it was about economic growth and about making the US a major power. That's why you find property and commerce throughout the US Constitution, but not words like nature, or ecosystem, or even labor. Labor, The word labor uh, doesn't exist within the US Constitution. So a lot of people at this point, you know, when we give talks and things, say, so what? We have an existing system, we gotta live within it. We gotta make it the best it can be. We gotta use the tools that we have. Okay, well, we got to a point where using those tools was not getting us where we needed to go because the communities we were working in were getting the toxic waste incinerators and the factory farms and all the other projects that they didn't want because they were exhausting this uh, administrative regulatory environmental law process. And in fact, we're coming to the conclusion that by almost every major environmental statistic in the US at least, things are worse now than they were 40 years ago before we passed the major environmental laws in the United States. So 40 years later, by almost every major environmental statistic, uh, things are worse now in the US than before when we passed those laws. So what happened to us? Well, we started looking around for a new system of law. We wanted to find out if anyone had invented a new system of law. And indigenous peoples, of course, have seen nature as something other than property for tens of thousands of years. It's just built into the indigenous uh, culture. In the US in 1972, and that's where we're gonna start this modern exploration of the rights of nature. In 1972, there was a law review article that was published by a guy named uh, Christopher Stone at the University of Southern California Law School. And for those that don't know, law review articles are articles written by lawyers and judges, and they get published in these, uh, these books 
uh, that are put out by law schools and generally just sit on the shelf gathering dust. I've written a few and mine certainly have gathered dust on the, uh, on the stands at, uh, at universities and libraries. But Christopher Stone wrote this piece called Should Trees, he wrote a piece and the title of it was Should Trees Have Standing? That was the title of the article that Christopher Stone wrote. And uh, it came out of a law school class that he was trying to wake up after lunch. And he threw out this concept of nature actually having access to the courts. So for people who the word standing is foreign to, uh, so again, his piece was called Should Trees Have Standing? Right now, the only way to access courts in the United States is as a person, a human being. You have to show some kind of injury to yourself or injury to your community of humans, your neighborhood or your municipality. But nature itself never gets into court. We can sue over the Clean Water Act and Clean Air Act and try to defend ecosystems through some of those laws. But nature itself can't access court. Forests can't walk into court. Mountains can't walk into court. And you and I can't serve as guardians for those ecosystems to actually cross the threshold of the court house and file actions. And the right to nature is really about changing that situation, but that's what conventional law is. So Christopher Stone's Law Review article probably would have gone unnoticed, even though it was this major new idea, except that there was a court case pending in the courts making its way up to the United States Supreme Court in that same time period. And the name of the case was Sierra Club versus Morton. It's not important to remember the name of the case, except to say that the Walt Disney Corporation wanted to build a ski resort in a place called Mineral King Valley, which is if you go directly east from San Francisco to the Nevada state line, uh, where Sequoia National Forest is now, that's where the Walt Disney Corporation wanted to put in the ski resort. Usually all I have to say about the ski resort is that they wanted a ski resort built that was bigger than Disneyland in that part of the state. 1.7 million annual visitors, 20,000 skiers, a huge development. The Sierra Club didn't want it. They thought it would be dangerous and harmful to the environment there. The Sierra Club sued. They sued to stop the project. The lower courts dismissed them, threw them out of court, saying that you haven't shown standing, that you as members of the Sierra Club are not going to be injured by this development because you don't live in that neck of the woods. And therefore you're not gonna suffer an injury to yourself as a human and therefore, we're going to throw you out of court because you don't have the requisite injury to show to actually stay in court. The case went up to the U.S. Supreme Court, and the U.S. Supreme Court threw them out as well on the same basis, that you lack standing. What made it different from others and made Christopher Stone's piece different from others that he published at the time was that Justice William O. Douglas, probably one of the most progressive Supreme Court justices that we've ever had on the U.S. Supreme Court, used the law review article written by Christopher Stone, Should Trees Have Standing, and wrote a dissenting opinion in the US Supreme Court that incorporated Christopher Stone's article into that court decision. So a dissenting opinion in which Justice William O. Douglas said that nature should have standing, that nature should have standing to come in the courthouse doors and make cases on the basis of injury to itself i.e. injury here to Mineral King Valley, rather than depending on humans to actually show injury to themselves rather than to the ecosystem that was being destroyed. So just to read a paragraph from Justice William O. Douglas's opinion, he wrote, a quote, contemporary public concern for protecting nature's ecological equilibrium should lead to the conferral of standing upon environmental objects to sue for their own preservation. This suit would therefore be more properly labeled as Mineral King versus Morton rather than Sierra Club versus Morton. So in other words, the ecosystem itself as a plaintiff suing to protect itself in which the standing or injury uh, requirement would be asked of the ecosystem, not of the individual human or group of humans that was bringing the suit. So a huge new idea, first law review article, well, actually, first of all, sleepy law school class, second law review article that came out of that and then third as a dissenting opinion in the US Supreme Court, and this happened in 1972. So the question we get asked next is, well, what happened? And the answer is almost nothing <laughs> happened after the 1972 uh, decision uh, came out, the dissenting opinion. Uh, it was used in a couple isolated places like Florida, for example, to bring a lawsuit on behalf of, of a population of key deer, loggerhead turtles, 
not much success. And all of it was brought under the Endangered Species Act and other federal laws that further limited how you could actually apply this kind of standing uh, inquire or standing test into that existing law. So when people ask, well, what happened? The answer is nothing happened. Very little happened, uh, except some courageous environmental lawyers tried to make a, a nascent attempt, a beginning attempt to try to use it. So that was 1972. The next major thing that happened with it happened in 2006. And it happened in a little place called Tamaqua Borough, which is a borough or a town uh, just northwest of Philadelphia, about 7,000 people. So a relatively small municipality in rural coal mining Pennsylvania, just to set the stage. And there was a project, the bright people, including the governor of Pennsylvania, had the bright idea of dredging the Delaware River, which happens all the time, dredging it to deepen the, the course for boat traffic. They wanted to take the dredgings from the Delaware River and dump it into the open mine pits that existed in Tamaqua Borough, which were left over from, from mining days in the borough. The problem with the dredging, of course, is that it contains a lot of nasty stuff, but one of the things it contains is PCBs, polychlorinated biphenyls one of the most toxic substances known to man, PCBs. And the community of Tamaqua said, well, we don't want to be a toilet, obviously, for this kind of dredge coming in. We already have cancer clusters in our community and in our county. We want uh, to not have this happen to our community. And they contacted us and asked us to begin working on a law, local law, a municipal ordinance that could be passed by the borough of Tamaqua that would ban this type of project from coming in, a ban on this dredge toxic waste coming into the community. And in because we had been reading up on Christopher Stone and what had happened in Sierra Club versus Morton, the dissenting opinion, and following up with some indigenous materials that we had been reading, that we had a conversation with the, with the borough council. So think elected officials of the borough of Tamaqua about trying to implement this rights of nature concept into Tamaqua Borough. So what did that mean? Well, it meant drafting a local law, an ordinance, a binding law within the community of Tamaqua that would recognize ecosystems within Tamaqua, including the Panther Creek and Little Schuylkill River. So two waterways, one of which is uh, part of Philadelphia's drinking water supply and about protecting them to the level of human civil rights protections under existing law. And what did that mean? Well, we drafted a local law for them that recognized that the river and the creeks had the right to exist, flourish, and naturally evolve. So basically constitutional type standards that elevated existing environmental protections to a higher level, to a rights-based system of protection level. And then we banned those activities or projects that would violate those rights. So that was the first piece of the law that we drafted, the rights piece, recognizing that ecosystems, in this case, rivers and creeks, had certain rights under the law, legally enforceable rights. Then we provided that any resident could sue on behalf of those ecosystems in court. So that as a resident, you could step into the shoes of the ecosystem, into the, shoe of the shoes of the Panther Creek or Little Schuylkill River, to actually bring an action in the name of the ecosystem against the offending party uh, to, for violations of those rights that occur, threatened violations of the right, those rights that occur. And the third part, the only reason I'm going through these one, two, three is because all the laws after this have basically been patterned on the same formula. And the third part is a remedy part, that the offending party, if you violate the rights of the creek or river in Tamaqua Borough, you have to restore it to its pre-damaged state. So first is the Declaration of Rights, legally enforceable rights. Second answers the who can sue. So the first part is really about the what. You know, what is this? What are the rights? The second is the who can sue. And the third is the remedy about what you gain if you have a lawsuit, what can a court order? And in this case, it's about restoration of the ecosystem back to its pre-damaged state before the violation of the rights occurred. So, Little community in Pennsylvania, Tamaco Borough, 2006, passes this law, makes some news across the state of Pennsylvania, makes some news, believe it or not, internationally, where newspapers and other media outlets covered some stories. Tamaco Borough was the first law in the world, so the first in the world, to recognize rights of nature in law. It's actually legally enforceable rights of nature into law. 
the I always say sometimes what a small world this is, and I think we were reminded of that when we got a call from folks working with the Ecuadorian uh, Constitutional Assembly in 2008. So in 2008, the Ecuadorians were, were writing a new constitution. They had elected folks from across the country to come together in one place to draft a new constitution for the country of Ecuador. They had learned about what had happened in Tamaqua, and they asked us to come down to assist with drafting language and telling stories about what had happened in the United States around these environmental laws to help them put rights of nature into their national Ecuadorian constitution. So we went down, uh, talked to them about, you know, the reason why these laws have been moving forward, the language that was used, shared the language, helped them draft some language as well. And that new national constitution included the rights of nature language that the assembly had drafted and, and put into that uh, draft constitution. That draft constitution was then ratified overwhelmingly by the people of Ecuador, thus making Ecuador the first country in the world to shift from kind of a property-based system of environmental protection tied up in this environmental regulatory stuff to moving towards a rights-based system of environmental protection. And so it was a huge moment, made, made a lot of news, uh, and uh, also made it fashionable to be talking about rights of nature, this new system of environmental protection. Since the passage of that new constitution in 2008, been about 60 enforcement cases. And I won't go at length through them. They deal with all kinds of things like shark fin fishing and mangrove protection. But the first case that was brought was called the Vilcabamba River versus the province of Loja. It was one of a uh, main river within Ecuador uh, that uh, sued a local government for dumping road debris waste into the river, just thus changing its flow. And the only reason I raised the case is that the Vilcabamba River was the plaintiff. So we're used to, to looking at cases and understanding people as plaintiffs or groups of people as plaintiffs or governments as plaintiffs or corporations as plaintiffs. In this case, the river was the plaintiff. And it was the first successful case within Ecuador to hold on, first successful case in the world, to hold on behalf of an ecosystem and vindicate these rights of nature around that particular ecosystem. The reason why what's happening in Ecuador is so important also because the constitutional court in Ecuador, which is the highest court in the country deciding constitutional issues, has now accepted many different cases for review that deal with rights of nature. We think to chart out uh, a new jurisprudence, a new set of rules about how to handle these rights of nature cases, basically to interpret whether they're going to protect areas, protected areas from mining, for example but set some broad rules about what rights of nature means within the country of Ecuador. So there have been a bunch of cases dealing with enforcement around rights of nature. We now have this exciting new phase where the constitutional court has accepted these new cases to basically define, further define, uh, what rights of nature means within the country of Ecuador. And I said, uh, this is a small, you know, small world in some ways, uh, but the, what happened in Ecuador boomerang back to the United States we were contacted by the city of Pittsburgh that was interested in stopping fracking, hydrofracking for natural gas within the city of Pittsburgh. For folks that don't know what hydrofracking for natural gas is, you basically drive high water, uh, high water, uh, water under high pressure into the ground to explode rock, to free the oil, to free the oil and gas from the ground and then harvest it. Uh, it's a very controversial kind of method. It's been uh, banned in Europe. Uh, but in the U.S. it's still going strong. Uh, and the concern by the Pittsburgh City Council was that fracking had been proposed underneath the Catholic, one of the Catholic cemeteries within the city of Pittsburgh. So in downtown Pittsburgh, uh, they, this oil and gas uh, company wanted to frack underneath grandpa and grandma, for want of a better, want of a better phrase wanted to frack underneath the Catholic cemetery. A lot of people got upset, not just for the impact of that fracking on the neighborhoods there, but also on ecosystems and the rivers, the three rivers that flow through the city of Pittsburgh, the Ohio, the Allegheny, the Monongahela. Uh, we assisted the city of Pittsburgh to draft a new law, which not only banned fracking, but also recognized the rights of the three rivers within the city of Pittsburgh. So essentially rights of the three rivers to be protected against damage from fracking chemicals 
uh, from upstream and other activities that might affect those uh, rivers. To our amazement, Pittsburgh City Council unanimously adopted the ordinance, uh, becoming probably the most well-known municipality in the U.S. to adopt uh, a rights of nature law. And to date, uh, we have about three dozen communities across the United States that have adopted similar laws, uh, like the city of Pittsburgh and like Tamaqua Borough, uh, to recognize rights of nature within their municipal boundaries. So then something happened that we didn't expect, which was uh, up until now, it was basically about law writing. So people writing rights of nature laws and then passing them through governmental entities like legislatures, uh, city, city councils, borough councils, uh, or doing it themselves through citizens initiative to put a law on the ballot and then have it voted by popular vote and then for it to go into effect. But what started to happen next really sped up or accelerated this whole process, which was courts across the globe began adopting rights of nature as judicial precedent without any laws, but saying that it represented a new emerging norm in international environmental law and therefore could be applied within those countries. So again, the, the difference was stark here. One was a slow process of moving rights of nature laws forward by writing them down, moving them through uh, elected governmental officials or through a, a citizens initiative process. But starting in 2016 with the Colombian Constitutional Court, in 2016, the court ruled that the Atrato River, one of the main tributaries within the country, had certain rights. And they derived their opinion not from a law that had been passed in Colombia, but from these other places that had adopted these laws as indicia or indicators that a new emerging environmental law norm was starting to happen. And they grabbed it and brought it into those courts. In 2017, a court in India recognized that the Ganges River had certain rights, again, building on this precedent from other places, but no law that had been passed in India. The Colombian Supreme Court in 2018 recognized that the Amazon and the Amazon River Basin had certain rights. Again, rights of nature being implemented by the judiciary, but not by the legislature. And in 2019, the High Court of Bangladesh ruled that all rivers in Bangladesh had certain legal rights. So that was in 2019. So we saw this uh, kind of spurt of rulings by courts uh, on rights of nature, even without any legislative activity within those countries, establishing rights of nature, but doing it themselves as courts and judges. And of course, in the United States, we have had tribes uh, that have voted on rights of nature laws and tribal constitutional provisions. So the Ho-Chunk tribe in 2015, the Ponca tribe in Oklahoma, the Ojibwe uh, Chippewa in Minnesota, the White Earth Nation, adopted the first law recognizing rights of wild rice. So Monoman, which is their cultural staple uh, for the White Earth Nation, they adopted a rights of nature law recognizing rights of wild rice on the reservation. The Menominee in Wisconsin recognized uh, rights of the Wisconsin River through a resolution. The Yurok tribe in California uh, adopted a tribal law recognizing the Klamath River as having rights. The Nez Perce just a couple months ago recognized the Snake River as having rights. So a lot of work being done within the tribal communities across the United States to integrate this rights of nature concept into their tribal constitution, into their resolutions, into their tribal codes. So just to finish up uh, today with a couple last things, uh, one is to recognize that it used to be that talking about rights of nature would kind of put you in a padded room. That 15 years ago, uh, you know, 15, 20 years ago, I, I did a speaking tour across the US with a South African lawyer on rights of nature. And we had law professors uh, walking out of the room where we were giving the talk because to them it was nutsville. It's crazy. It's like the radical fringe kind of stuff. And they couldn't even by their presence uh, give any kind of validation to the to the concept. We had students coming up saying, wow, this is great. We want to work on it. But law professors kind of left the room. Uh, that doesn't happen anymore. It doesn't mean that rights of nature is mainstream. I, I, I still think it's on the edge of that. I'm convinced that over the next uh, 20 years, it's going to become the emerging em environmental norm. It's going to become the you know, the exciting new work that, that people do around environmental law. But this kind of moving into the mainstream 
uh, is about, you know, Tulane Law School. We co-hosted a conference with them uh, several years ago on the rights of nature. Vermont Law School has held a symposium on the rights of nature. The Levin College of Law in Gainesville, we partnered with to do a rights of nature conference uh, with, and partnered with the Florida Rights of Nature Network to do that conference in Gainesville. The Democratic Party of Florida now has a rights of nature plank. The Democratic Party of Florida put a rights of nature plank into their own platform. Even more amazingly, the Democratic National Committee in 2016 had a plank in the DNC platform about rights of nature in indigenous communities, supporting the adoption of rights of nature within indigenous communities. Uh, major newspapers like the Orlando Sentinel, uh, the League of Women Voters uh, in Florida has endorsed this rights of nature concept. So it's, it's kind of moving from, from that fringe area, radical area, as things get worse, necessarily in some ways because of the system we've created, but moving more towards mainstream where it's gotten more widespread acceptance and it's continuing to move in that direction. And I would also say, you know, just to finish out here with Florida, which is that in uh, Florida, we have a, a situation where folks have been following the water quality situation in Florida, red tide, algae blooms, uh, dead sea life uh, occurring within uh, the state. Last time I was there, there were backhoes and, and bulldozers picking up dead sea life off the, off the beach. Uh, and Biscayne Bay, which is in the southeastern part of the state, went to zero dissolved oxygen levels a couple months ago. We don't have to be a biologist to understand that zero dissolved oxygen levels is a bad thing, that life can't exist in the water column without oxygen uh, being there. And a lot of that stuff that's happening in Florida gave birth to a uh, Orange County, Florida initiative, which was on the ballot this past November, uh, called the Right to Clean Water Initiative within Orange County, uh, was placed on the ballot, county of about 1.5 million people, 30th largest county in the United States, biggest place ever in the United States, at least, to vote on or, or take a vote, have on the ballot, a Rights of Nature initiative. It recognized the Wakaiba and Econ Lockhatchee rivers as having, and other waters within Orange. So the focus was on two rivers, Econ, the Econ Lockhatchee rivers, the Wakaiba River, and then it was expanded out to include all waters within Orange County. But the right to exist, flow, be free from pollution, and maintain a healthy ecosystem. And I don't think anybody really knew what would happen when that went on the ballot, uh, but in Orange County, it received an 89% vote uh, in the county, which is unheard of uh, for initiatives to receive 89% vote. Uh, but it, it all goes to say that people in Florida can't agree on much of anything politically, uh, except perhaps for clean water uh, and, uh, and this rights of nature concept that's built into that uh, clean water initiative that appeared on the ballot. So that was a big, big deal. We we're getting calls from folks who uh, learn about uh, what happened in Orange County and want to follow up with that. And just as a final thing before we open it up for questions and, and discussion is that we're kind of the go-to people now for drafting uh, these uh, rights of nature laws for municipalities. As Mari mentioned at the beginning, uh, we're involved in about 10 different states with communities who are moving forward with new rights of nature laws. We've also created a campaign team uh, that's composed of two lawyers and one of the key organizers in Florida uh, that did the Florida initiative, basically to for that campaign team to support these efforts in different places. Once there's a draft of a rights of nature law for the campaign team to help with petition uh, creation, citizens initiative process, uh, even talking to elected officials, doing everything that builds campaigns around these initiatives to get them passed into law. And so that's an exciting new development. Uh, in addition to the fact that we're now hosting a council on the implementation of the rights of nature at the federal level uh, that includes uh, some tribal indigenous leaders. Uh, Karana Gore uh, sits on the, on the board as well, uh, along with uh, Professor Oliver Houck uh, from Tulane Law School, but essentially a way to begin to push the Biden administration or some administration agencies towards uh, integrating, implementing some rights of nature concepts uh, and suggesting things like executive orders around these rights of nature concepts as well. So uh, that's it from me for today. Uh, we'd like to spend the rest of the time that we have about uh, 15 minutes or so with uh, questions or comments. Uh, if you want to unmute yourself and then ask a question and then we can have a discussion around it. 
Hi, um, I'll go first if nobody else is out there. Um, my name is Kelly Clark. I'm an attorney at LA Waterkeeper. And I was just curious, how is there a way to bring these suits without a law enshrined with a citizen suit provision? Like, is there a way to do that under the Clean Water Act or another hook to get into court on? So the, the, sh the short answer is we don't believe so. Okay. That when we talk about rights of nature, we're specifically talking about driving and embedding those rights of nature into law and then using the law as a platform to then bring a private cause of action to enforce those rights. The only other way we've seen it happen uh, is through uh, trying to influence permit processes, but that influence of permit processes only happens if you have a rights of nature law in place that you can use to influence the permit process. And the, the place that we talk about with that is a little place in Pennsylvania where that passed a, a rights of nature law and a ban on frack wastewater injection wells. The State Department of Environmental Protection just last year recognized the local law as a reason to not issue the state permit. And that was the first time we've seen that in the United States, kind of a, a, a place where uh, the, the state permit issuance was influenced by the adoption of rights of nature law in that particular place. Um, and we're always looking for creative ways and working with partners to move them in different ways, but I, I can't really see a way to do that without a legal platform in place. Okay, great, thank you. Other questions? Uh, Mr. Lindsay. Um, I was thrilled to see an introduction with His Holiness the Dalai Lama and Greta Thunberg about climate feedback loops. And I'm, I'm hoping everybody um, gets to see those short movies and wondering how they could be helpful in instigating adoption of your work. Because it looks like we're running out of time. I, I love the quote that they used. They said, Na Mother Nature has... Uh, your world's on fire, Mother Nature has fire extinguishers, but we're approaching a tipping point when those fire extinguishers won't be enough anymore. Uh, referring to habitat fragmentation and our lack of understanding of a tipping point. How can we use that? Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more with what you said. I mean, a lot of our work has been a, a frustration at the pace at which environmental protection has emerged. And I got tired of going to conferences where people talked about how much they love nature, but weren't willing to actually create a new system through which they could love nature. <laughs> right. So I think uh, there are a lot of things out there happening now out of necessity, you know, whether they're videos or other platforms that are being used. But the real mind shift that has to happen is uh, this law shift that has to happen as a result of this reorganization of our brains about what's needed. And the, it's such a difficult conversation to have because when, when some project comes into your community that wants to do something harmful, the first thing that people do is reach for the existing tools that are there, the toolbox that they have. But this is about building a new toolbox. And that's, that's the hardest part for people to get their brains around because we don't see ourselves as law drafters, we, as a people in the United States, at least, just to globalize for a moment, just to, to generalize, that we, we see ourselves as basically subordinate to a system of government that's paid to make the, you know, decisions for us. So we're happy when we're, our job is to try to influence decision makers or file comments or uh, file opposition to some EPA uh, agency project or whatever. But when it comes down to saying we should be see ourselves as law drafters and law enforcers and law adopters, it's really difficult for a lot of people to get their heads around that because it means changing who they are changing how they see themselves within this system of governance. And so the biggest problem that we have is not, not the documentarians that say how bad things are, because, because a lot of us know how bad things are, and a lot of people know how bad things are. The question is, how do we translate that into a new system that's actually going to stop things from getting worse and then restore things that need to be restored? And that that's a mental thing. It's almost like a uh, colonization thing, that our brains have been colonized to not think of ourselves as folks that could take the lead uh, around these things. And so it's, a, it's, as someone just said, a mindset shift that has to take place. So I think all these things are important, all these, all these uh, videos and all the, the stuff that's coming out now, which I think is really good, is really important, but the, it's also important to understand that this is about making a shift as to how we think about the existing system and how do we build a new one.
Other questions today? Gabrielle, you have your hand up. Hi. Uh, hi, Thomas. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm just curious. I've also been noticing some developments of ecocide laws mm -hmm. taking some, you know, getting some momentum. Um, I'm wondering if, if the two can work together and how, if anything, can it focus on uh, international waters or air or atmosphere where there is no jurisdictions? Yeah, great questions. Uh, and uh, the on the first one, the ecocide stuff is not much different than the rights that are recognized within law for ecosystems to exist. So like in Orange County, in your state, Florida, there's a, a right for waterways uh, for these rivers and waters to quote exist within Orange County. It's almost like a right to life for ecosystems that are codified by that law. There's really no difference between the, the ecocide laws and the right to life for ecosystems in the US because ecocide says, uh, says that uh, killing off an ecosystem is a crime. Well, the rights of nature laws that we draft have that right to exist, which is also about recognizing the right of existence of the ecosystem. So from a, from a legal position, there's very little difference between the two, uh, in fact, almost none. So we see it basically as part of the same kind of riverbed moving forward with recognizing uh, elevated heightened legal protections for ecosystems. It's just using slightly different language. And it, in terms of climate and these, these other uh, issues, these other systems, we have people now applying rights of nature to climate protections, recognizing a right to climate, a right to a livable climate for people, for human beings, but also a right of climate. So a rights of nature law as applied to climate. Uh, there are a couple of communities that are working towards that. In fact, one has already been passed in Lafayette, Colorado. So a city in Colorado, recognizing a right of climate and a right to climate. So I think the rights of nature stuff, it, we're only at the beginning of how it's been applied, mostly to waterways and water systems. But I think there's a whole new world out there about how it can be applied to these other, other places and other ecosystems and other things. Uh, Joseph, you have your hand up. I think uh, Bogdana was before me. Bogdana, you have your hand up. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, quick one. So I don't have a legal background, uh, so I learned a lot. And I'm curious um, regarding Warren Lessing's, uh, Warren's Lessing notion of code is law, which he writes about in Code and Other Walls of Cyberspace. And so my question is like, how do you think technology could enable and scale your work and what kind of technology? Yeah, it's a great question. We just partnered with uh, a, a group called uh, Wu Projects and the Turan Collective uh, to do some trainings around rights of nature. And they're using a platform called Hilo, H-Y-L-O. Uh, basically in the first, first real technology platform to bring rights of nature people together uh, as both resources and uh, to get materials and those types of things. So I think those platforms, I think we're only scratching the surface, of course, because that's just a generalized web platform where people can go and get questions answered and engage in discussion. But it's the first time I've seen it happening. And there are probably a variety of other ways for uh, people younger than I uh, <laughs> to, to figure those web services and, and kind of web platforms out. But I think the sky's the limit on all those things. So we're, we only have a couple minutes left. Uh, Joseph, do you want to go next? Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, so, um, if I understand the Citizens United finding properly, the mind bending aspect of it is what it said that um, corporations had rights under the Constitution, First Amendment rights, right? freedom of speech. So, does that set a precedent for rights of nature that if corporations have rights under the Constitution, then why can't an animate object like nature have rights under the Constitution? Yeah, and in fact, that that is a great question. It's one of the things that people in Florida, Orange County, were talking about. That one of their bylines or one of their taglines was, "If corporations can have rights, why not nature? Why not ecosystems?" We just have to be careful because corporations are technically property. You know, so you can buy and sell a corporation; it's a piece of property, as evidenced by the charter or the Articles of Incorporation. And so, you know, giving human rights to property is not what we're talking about. So there's not an exact parallel there. And we also don't want to continue that bad evolution of law towards property as having civil rights. So we just have to be careful there. Uh, and I think it's an easy tagline to use about 
corporations have rights, why not nature? Because people understand it innately or uh, inherently, I think. But in terms of we don't also want to validate this concept that civil rights protections have been wrapped around property because that puts us in a really bad place as well. And to have Citizen United go away. Absolutely. And in fact, the, the work that we've done, including envisioning what a new U.S. Constitution would look like, we just launched a project, uh, ournewconstitution.org, which is seeking to reimagine what the U.S. Constitution could look like as a source code that has rights of nature in it, for example, and eliminates corporate rights, which is part of the piece of that new constitutional structure. Kelly, you have your hand up. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm currently learning, uh, I, I don't come from a law background and I'm currently learning about the sustainable development goals and about uh, rights of law here in Europe and in France. And um, I was wondering if you'd have any advice for just a young person who would be interested in, in kind of following in your footsteps and kind of pursuing the rights of, rights of nature laws. Like, and where do you see like this kind of, uh, where do you see this going in, in the future? Thanks. Yeah, so I, I think it's a, as they, they talk about some things, a growth industry, <laughs> the, right, the rights of nature. Uh, but a, there's a lot of groups now sinking their teeth into rights of nature. It's a great time, I think, to be involved uh, because there's so much to be, to be developed. There's so much evolution that needs to, be, needs to happen. Um, you know, we're playing around with bringing municipal codes into compliance with rights of nature laws in different places. But from a lawyer's perspective, the, the sky's the limit. We're at the very, very beginning still of a lot of this rights of nature, uh, evolution of the rights of nature and jurisprudence. And as a young person, I mean, you have to decide, you know, a lot of people say, well, this is lawyer's work or you got to go to law school to engage in it. I actually find the opposite. The, the lawyers are usually the problem. <laughs> You know? And so, you know, in the 10 years I did conventional legal work, I was kind of the problem. I was pointing people towards using the conventional environmental law system as a remedy when it really wasn't. And so a lot of times the lawyers are the problem. The, the place where I see the newest ideas emerge are the activists, activist organizations that are coming to grips with the rights of nature or working within communities to, for the first time, pass a draft and pass a rights of nature law. So. I would say it doesn't matter that you're a lawyer, it doesn't matter that you go to law school, it's just a question of getting involved with the network of folks that are beginning to work on rights of nature stuff and, and getting a feel for that. Or if you're, you know, if your uh, specialty is, is tech, uh, finding a way to get rights of nature stuff out there more and more through these different platforms, uh, working within your state or locality to foster state constitutional amendments, for example. People are now talking about state constitutional amendments to put rights of nature into state constitutions, which is a very exciting area as well. So all of those options, but uh, anybody that wants to, wants to talk about those more, anybody who wants to get more involved in the work that we're doing, feel free to contact us through our, through our webpage. Mari posted that earlier to the, to the chat. Uh, but um, so we're coming to the close of the hour. We don't like to keep people uh, past this, uh, but uh, we've also recorded this session. So we'll make the recording available to whoever wants it uh, through our webpage. Uh, and again, anybody wants more information can contact us at info at center for environmental rights.org. So that's info at center for environmental rights.org. And uh, we're on Facebook, Twitter, you name it, web platform, we're on it. So I look forward to hearing from everybody. And I just wanted to thank everybody for carving out the time to, to be here today and uh, looking forward to chatting with many of you in the in the near future thank you guys